Hello, everyone, and we are back with episode 112, episode 112 of the Vacation Rental Blueprint and continuing on our partner profile series this week. But before we do that, I have to introduce my co-host, TC. TC, how's it going? Hey, great back and better than ever. Looking forward to another partner profile today. What, what's our what's our saying? Uh, back and trying harder than ever. I think that's our that's our go to. Yeah, we try uh, hard. We try real hard. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So TC, last time you and I talked, I, we've talked a little more this week than uh, than normal as we uh, are running in all sorts of different directions. But uh, we had a little storm run through our area, and we had a, a few power outages and. Uh, I guess some power outage residual damages hit a few of our properties this week. So it's, you know, a pain. It's a giant pain in the ass sometimes to deal with that. And I think that's one of those concerns that so many uh, short-term vacation rental owners have when they think about self-managing. You know, you and I talk a lot about so many owners' prevalent fear of having to unclog a toilet in the middle of the night. And, oh, God, how are they? You know, they they just don't want to deal with that. So let me go ahead and give a property management company 20 to 30% of my revenue off the top. And guess what? That property management company is not going to do it either, but they're going to make it seem like they will. So they'll give you that peace of mind. But we had, a, I think in a couple cases, some direct lightning strikes on properties uh, this week that uh, fried some internet routers. And because we have all of our homes set up with uh, kind of smart home technology, exterior cameras on the perimeter, uh, the alarms, every, everything sort of, when it happened, everything sort of lit up in terms of we got warnings on our phones and smartwatches on, hey, this is off, this is off, this is off, this is off. And you have that moment of panic, but then you also understand, as we've talked about in previous episodes, that uh, we might not be in the area, but we've got great partners and we've built these great relationships so that when something like this happens, man, we we can jump on the phone and we can solve problems at, at a pretty amazing uh, reach in order to get some of these uh, issues that popped up addressed. This is a challenging situation, but once again, you can get through it with great partners. And you know, you think about it. Um, if you check the weather for Florida from this point all the way through probably October. You're going to see thunder and lightning in the forecast most every day. It's just the nature of, of being in Florida. And, you know, it just takes lightning hitting either direct or nearby, and it has an impact. And what happened, you know, yesterday, day before, was the power came back on, but in some of the properties, it didn't because there were breakers. And it seems like a complex situation. But, Tim, as you outlined, with good partners and good technology, Gosh, we were able to get through this in record time and the home back up and running with really no issues, but maybe a few uh, minor things that have to still be resolved. Yeah, it was great because with uh, we use, and I think in, in our technology episode we talked about, we use uh, Alarm.com. And I actually got a text message when the power went out at the property. So I just got, you know, ding, 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 ding. All these, all these properties are out. And then slowly they would come back online and there was... There were two properties that were kind of straggling. I didn't get a notification on them, but you know, I got an alarm.com notification that said uh, less than one percent of the properties in this area are without power right now. Just sort of giving me some context to uh, to say, oh shit, okay, I have to <laughs> I have to go. Uh, this this is an outlier, and uh, let me jump on the phone. Um, you know, in, in this case, another shout out for our sponsor, Cleaning B&B. Uh, you know, this is where having a great cleaning company can fill in a lot of gaps for a property manager that is much more impactful, where I can get someone on site. And I understand it'll, it'll take a, a site visit fee, but I've got a relationship with a cleaning company that can come by, they can check on the property, they can give me an, a, an assessment, um, you know, with, with a great relationship. They can be there to let in uh, you know, a cable company if they need to reset or replace routers. Um, but it, it, again, it just goes back to having these great vendor relationships because you never know when these challenges are going to pop up. I mean, these properties have endured last year alone two pretty strong hurricane slash tropical storms. 
uh, no issue. They they kind of just shook it off with with no no issue, no no extended power outages. And then this little this little but powerful storm blows through uh, here in spring, and you know all hell breaks <laughs> loose at the houses. So um, you know it's it's again just really paying off around uh, having those great relationships. Well, it's also made me think about something that I really hadn't spent enough time thinking about, and that is, you know, how do you protect your appliances and your technology inside the home when lightning does strike nearby or even a direct hit? And, you know, what I'm what I'm researching now is whole home surge protection. And uh, I've talked to several electrical companies. I've talked to our technology company. And what I'm looking to do is, you know, bring in a whole home surge protection system so that when lightning does strike, it doesn't blow out all the TVs and it doesn't blow out the refrigerator and and so on and so forth. So I would say uh, within a couple of weeks, I'll have that fully installed in a few of the homes and uh, feel much better about, yeah, it's going to happen. I mean, Florida, you're going to have storms, you're going to have lightning but at least I don't have to worry about the TVs and all the appliances and so forth that could really, you know, shut me down for a period of time. So that's my next endeavor. I'm uh, doing the research right now and I will probably have that installed within a couple of weeks. And, and no matter where you are in the country, I mean, replace thunderstorm slash hurricane slash tropical storm with, you know, blizzard with nor'easter with, uh, you know, localized fires, large fires, you know, there, there's, you know, there's events all over the country that are are going to, you know, require you to have these relationships. And then also think about, you know, solutions like this whole home surge protection. You know, what is what is what are some solutions that you can implement and think about in your property to help protect you from uh, these natural events that uh, could impact your ability to list the property and do business in the property? TC, what do you have a general sense for pricing for something like a whole home surge protector, just general range? Cause I know you're, you're still working on the process. Yeah. So when, uh, when I talked, I talked to four different firms and then I talked to our technology company and there's a couple of types of installation. They're going to do one at the electrical panel and that electrical panel will protect a lot of the appliances. And then they've got to install a commercial grade surge protector at every device so TVs and so forth. And uh, you don't have to do them all. You want to do the ones that you are, are most worried about. So as an example, you know, we've got a TV that costs three or $400. Probably not going to worry about that. But the one in the theater room, you know, that was a six or $7,000 investment. So I'll protect that one. So all in, I'm probably looking at about $1,200. And I've learned that if you go through the electric company, not only do you have the charge, but you have the monthly charge. They charge you a monthly fee. Um, so I'm going with our technology company. They do a great whole home surge protection system. I won't have the monthly fee. I'll have the one-time cost, but I'll also have the comfort that when lightning does strike, not going to be an issue. Awesome. Well, we've, uh, we've, we're dangerously close to turning this into a, uh, power outage episode. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and, and pivot us into, uh, the, the very exciting episode we have today, continuing our partner profiles series, our best in class series, uh, with this week's focus being on the legal side. And, uh, as we've said now for, I mean, goodness, what, 11 hours of, of content and sharing our expertise, uh, Everyone listening, if, if you own a short-term rental or you are thinking about it, you are owning or thinking about buying a business. And with that business, you know, comes the legal requirements of operating the business. So today I'm very excited uh, to have Cassandra Jude from the Jude Law Firm joining us. Hello, Cassandra. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? We're doing we're doing great over here, and and we're excited to kind of kick this series off. We've got got a couple episodes uh, lined up with you uh, because there's so much that goes into operating these businesses uh, the right way with the right protections, and and also thinking about uh, you know all of the potential scenarios that you need to protect yourself uh, as a business owner from. So, take a couple minutes. Tell us about yourself and and about your firm. 
Best name for a firm ever, by the, the way. Jude Law Firm. Well done. You got to capitalize on the celebrity name of someone else. Yeah. <laughs> we, I was going to do a whole opening banter just about Jude Law, but I was like, ah, I don't know how Cassandra feels about that. So we're going <laughs> to we're, we're gonna move on. <laughs> so um, thank you for the intro. I have been in the legal industry for roughly 12 years now in some capacity, um, my firm does a little bit of everything. We try to make ourselves available at reasonable pricing for small businesses. So we do business formation, business law. Um, prior to opening my own firm, I did work at the biggest insurance defense firm in Florida. And then before that, I was also a public defender, which is where everyone is uh, continuing to seek me out for criminal defense right. representation well we haven't needed those services yet but uh note to self right <laughs> but of course i also have to do my lawyer spiel and say hey you know i'm only licensed in the state of florida and our discussion today tim and tc oh, does not create an attorney client relationship with your viewers this is general advice only you can more than happy to speak to you guys on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but you know, the bar requires that. So. Absolutely. So today, you know, I, I really want to spend some time just making sure everyone comes away from this episode on un understanding that part of getting into the short-term vacation rental space, investment property space, anything that's going to be bringing in uh, revenue from outside sources really requires the understanding of what one needs to do and why one needs to establish an entity uh, for this business. It isn't just simply, let me go ahead and buy uh, a second home and let me go ahead and rent it out. And no one's going to, you know, it's, it's fine. We'll just, all that revenue will just go straight into my checking account. It's, it's totally fine. So I, I, I feel like, you know, just getting your perspective on why, you know, why should a, why should an owner or someone thinking about owning a short-term rental, why is an entity so important for them? And is, is LLC, you know, a, a good avenue to explore when they are first kind of digging into the, the option to buy a short-term rental property? Sure. So, I would hope that when you're purchasing a property and you're getting into that short-term rental kind of space that you're thinking about the long-term. I know often people aren't. They say, okay, I'm going to flip this house. I'm going to make some money really fast on Airbnb. But, you know, long-term, when you create an entity, particularly, I always highlight the LLC. So an LLC is a hybrid it's a little bit like a um, solo practitioner kind of uh, deal, but it's also got some corporation elements. Um, the, the specific thing and the reason that I'm saying long term is when you create an LLC, what you're doing is you're protecting your personal assets in the event that something happens. That's what I mean when I say long term. Like you got to look at this like a business because right. if something ever happens, you do not want your personal assets to become a part of a, like, let's say lawsuit. Like I'm going to use a lot of examples today because fine print's boring, right? <laughs> and so <laughs> no. it's easier for people to go, okay, that makes sense. Like, let's say that, you know, you have, it's your second Airbnb booking ever and you have somebody come in and they slip and fall and they mm -hmm. break their leg, which is expensive and they sue you. And if you do not have an LLC, they can tap into everything that you have. Let's say you have more than one property because Florida is homesteaded. So they may not get your real home, but they'll get your other short-term rental properties. They'll get, you know, your boat, your personal mm -hmm. um, accounts. And so with an LLC, you're protecting all that. You're separating it out. So you have, let's say the Tim and TC LLC. That's what you're routing all of your, your short terms through. Then right. they're not having access to Tim and TC, and then also Tim and TC LLC. It is just the LLC, so it's it's really what I would recommend to do. There are a lot of benefits for tax purposes as well, 
um, for LLCs. And it makes your accounting easier as well. That's what I mean when I say, you know, long term, you don't want to be funneling the money through your personal accounts. It can right. be complicated and risky. And so there really isn't a downside to forming an entity, in my opinion. And I think that, you know, when someone hears forming an entity, uh, there, there's a percentage of our listeners that are like, uh, what? Like, I, I don't even know. Like, I don't even know mm -hmm. how or what to do. What are some initial, you know, just steps and, and resources that are publicly available that people can get started on this? Because it, it's, you know, and, and you and I are talking, you know, here in, here in Florida, as, as we mentioned at the top. But I mean, in general, most states are going to have, you know, access to, to resources to answer these, these entity and LLC questions readily available, right? You know, the, it's the Department of Corporations for that state. And, you know, as we know, anything that is a state agency, they might not be as available as they should be. However, there are resources that they push out online. I mean, and generally, right. You're, you're right. It is the same in almost every state. Um, so to form an LLC, you know, you first want to have a business name, right, obviously. So mm -hmm. for our example, Tim and TCLC. Okay, so we got the business name. Now in Florida, the state of Florida requires you to appoint a registered agent that's actually mm -hmm. in state. And what a registered agent is, is just a designated person that will receive any kind of law legal documents and notices that are being sent to your business. Okay. I don't recommend that you put yourself down because if you're say you're operating a business in state and you put yourself down because you don't want to be on the hook for dealing with all that. I always recommend right. you find like a service because then their, their only job is to call you or email you and say, Hey, we got this notice in the mail. I mean, that's their yep. only job and they're and it's very affordable and you can Google and find services that are just registered agents. So once you have that, then you simply have to file what's called articles of organization. And it sounds very scary. It's not at all. <laughs> not scary at all. It's just your business name, who is responsible, your principal place of business, the registered agent, and how you guys are going to manage it. And you, you file that with um, the Department of Corporation. And then, you know, depending on who is involved, like if it's just you, like if it's just him, you may not need an operating agreement, but if there's more than one person involved, I always recommend having an operating agreement. And then from there, you know, for tax purposes, you're going to want to do an employer identification number with the IRS and obtain any business license that are required. And I know that sounds intimidating and we can unpack everything um, however you want, but it's really not as scary as you think. And it provides a huge peace of mind. Yeah. And I think the operating agreement, you know, as, as we look at, you know, home prices where they are for someone looking to enter into this space, home prices, uh, still high. We're not seeing huge drops in home pricing combined with high interest rates. You're, you're seeing individuals look creatively uh, at ways to get into uh, investment property, short-term rentals, and you're seeing partners come together. You know, well, I've got a little bit and you've got a little bit and, and she has a little bit. So let's bring this all together and get into this. And that that really goes back to an operating agreement and uh, eventually, inevitably, if it's a three-person you know, agreement, there's going to be disagreement or there's going to be you know, something that requires clear designation of who's responsible for what, who, how decisions are made. And, and that operating agreement will really go a long way and gives everyone a peace of mind uh, for uh, going in to a, you know, into an entity with multiple parties to get into this space because it is, it's very expensive to get into this space right now in a lot of instances. And this is going in with a group of people is a great way or a great consideration to get into it. But uh, it, without an operating agreement, you're, you're basically setting yourself up for one big ugly fight the first time. That, sure. uh, you all don't agree. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we, we've got a ton of listeners that are already in the short term rental space and, and they're working to grow and expand and and solidify their operations so that they can they can grow and expand the right way. 
Um, but we've also got individuals who are looking right now for their first property uh, is before they before they have a property before they've you know signed on the dotted line or under contract is that there's benefit to them working through this LLC establishment prior to any of that right there there's no address for a property required they can set up their entity while they're searching for their first property correct yes absolutely and in fact i would recommend it because depending on if you're mortgaging a property for example um, it's really in your best interest to start the process as an LLC. And now, Cassandra, I found in Florida with the mortgage companies we worked with, a lot of the mortgage companies won't let you close on a property in the name of the LLC. You have to do it as the individual and then quit claim deed it over are there other things that our listeners should think about when they think about closing on a property and getting it into an LLC? Some of them will let you put it in the, the property purchase and the LLC's name with a um, guarantee, a personal guarantee under your name still. That's one way you can do it. Another is that, yes, the property purchaser, so in your case, TC, would purchase the property under his name and then you can warranty deed or quit claim deed the property to the LLC. Um, that's another way to do it. But I mean, yeah, I mean, you really nailed it. Those are really the only two situations that I see in the industry currently. So it's, it's interesting because I, we've been doing this, you know, a few episodes now and, and I hear, you know, I can, I'm starting to hear my listeners' questions pop in the back of my head as we have these conversations. And um, you, you had mentioned a personal guarantee. Could you just dig into that a little bit? Like, I know we had talked about LLC and protections. And then, you know, if I'm looking at this and it requires a personal guarantee as a first time short term rental buyer, how, how should I look at a personal guarantee? And is, is there a way to circumvent a personal guarantee in, in, in any case? Yeah. I mean, so if like, let's say I was your lawyer, I wouldn't recommend you do that <laughs> because you're, right. you're completely dipping into the protection of an LLC and to give you a little bit of a, I'm trying to not make it boring, you know, but legal stuff's boring sometimes. <laughs> We'll, have some, we'll, we'll put some cool graphics up or something. It's fine. Yeah, that's my PowerPoint up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that instantly instantly eliminates boring. Just add a PowerPoint <laughs> to the equation, right? That's <laughs> buzzwords. <laughs> so, <Yes>. uh, <laughs> so when you personally guarantee something against the LLC, also what you're doing is a form of piercing the corporate veil. Super boring right. word. All right, but. It's an important legal word in the sense that if your creditors come after you or like a mm -hmm. liability situation occurs, like let's reference back to the slip and fall. If they've got a really good lawyer and they know you have assets because they'll do a search on you personally, they will figure out potentially that you personally guaranteed something, which is merging your personal right. with your business. And at that point, then they can make an argument to the judge that, hey, not only do we get to go after the LLC, but they've dipped in with personal funds. They've signed their personal name on stuff as opposed to saying, I am signing as an agent of the LLC. There is a difference. Um, mm -hmm. And then at that point, you could still be exposed. So if it was my personal preference, I would do what you previously said, TC, which was um, warranty deed or quick claim deed the property if it's in a personal name. I mean, if you have a brand new LLC, it's likely that the mortgage company is not going to feel that you're a good enough, you know, candidate in terms of financial stability to allow you to sign on. So at that point, buy it yourself, quit claim deed or warranty deed it to the LLC. Makes sense. So what I found in Florida, and maybe you could talk to this a bit to Cassandra, is that I'm sure every state's different. But when you deed the property into the LLC, every state has a fee associated with that. At first, the, uh, the fee in Florida was a bit shocking to me. But when I stepped back, I thought, well, the long-term benefit here is what I'm going after. So yeah, there's a bit of a fee to get it into the LLC. But long-term, what I'm protecting is much more valuable than this fee. Could you talk to the fee structure a bit and how our listeners should think about that? 
Sure. Yeah. And I just, I just pulled the Miami Dade County tax rate just to give like a reference. So it's, I mean, it's 60 cents per a hundred dollar for single family residences. And in the, the big scheme of things, let's, I, again, I'm, I'm using the same reference cause it just makes sense. But if somebody slips and falls <laughs> and they sue you for like $2 million, because that's really what happens. And you don't even think about it is 60 cents per a hundred dollar worth it at that point. Because to me, that that's how I do everything in life, right? Like it's a cost benefit analysis. So right. 60 cents per 100, let's say it's like a $150,000 home. It would be like 1050, roughly 1050. Horrible at math. That's, that's why I went to law school, right? But that, <laughs> it, that in, in, in comparison to 2 million, for example, because that's really what happens. Right. So, I mean, you're really dealing with that. So to me, yeah, I mean, it would be worth the cost to have the peace of mind. And we've talked slip and fall. I mean, there, there's so many things that can, you know, happen, you know, while someone is on vacation, but I think our, our listeners and our viewers are, are probably thinking like, I, what do you mean? What do you mean if someone slips and falls, they, that I'm responsible? And it's like, it, well, you're, you're operating a business and uh, these individuals are oftentimes traveling in from out of state with their family and they're there having fun. Um, they slip and fall. You know, it's, it's not just a, a slip and fall. It's, you know, God forbid someone injures themselves and needs to go to the hospital. Um, well, you know, now not only are they going to the hospital, but they're out of state potentially from where they're from where they live, and uh, now they've got to change travel plans if the you know if it's a, a broken bone or something that's going to require some extra time. And and I, I know I'm playing a little bit of the uh, the doom and gloom role here, but it is something that we all need to think about and why setting an entity up for your business is so important. Because what if that individual now has to miss work? Right. And what if they need to miss an extended time away from work on top of extend their stay and, you know, hospital fees if they're out of state? I mean, this does vary to your point, Cassandra, this does very quickly add up from a from a liability perspective. And, and I think we'll you know, we've got another episode here coming up um, in our series where we'll dig into a little more of those those liability protections. But it's really important to go into this with you know the the understanding that as a business you have a customer staying at your property and there's some responsibilities you have as the owner of the business uh, to that customer while they're at your property and that's where an LLC really does establish and protect your personal side from the business side and also just to, to real quick, uh, doom and gloom's my specialty. So I really, <laughs> I enjoy when you talk doom and gloom because that's like my whole job, you know, is people come and they're like, I don't know what, you know, I don't know the first thing about this. What's the worst case that'll happen and how do I protect myself? And you know, if you do that, if you do take those moments of doom and gloom, you can then spend the rest of your business life you know, kicking back and relaxing, knowing that you have those protections in place. So the doom and gloom right. is important. We'll title this the doom and gloom podcast, and then we'll talk about more <laughs> fun stuff later. Oh, right? I like that. I, I think <laughs> next episode's doom and gloom. Maybe this is the uh, doom and gloom prequel. More doom, more gloom next episode. <laughs> <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> yeah. Well, TC, I think we've uh, we've set up episode 113. This is episode 112, but I think we've done a nice job of setting up episode 113 as we talk uh, about some insurance and uh, some protections uh, that, that insurance can provide. But as we close out our LLC, our entity episode, any other questions or thoughts that we want to uh, review with Cassandra? You know, when you form the LLC... I know there is the upfront work that has to be done and the upfront cost. Is there any annual renewal or any type of annual process that's involved in maintaining an LLC? There is an annual um, renewal, essentially. It's not the correct term, but it's the easiest way to explain. So once a year before September, but really before May, because if you push it out like a lot of my clients do it there's a late fee involved so really just put it in your head before may every year except the year i formed my llc i have to file an annual um filing just giving the department of corporation an update 
and usually nothing's changed, but they want to know, are the members or the managers of the LLC the same? You have the same registered agent, same principal address, and that's all you have to do. Um, and then if you, you utilize their registered agent service, you also need to renew with them as well. So Tim, I think to, to recap uh, for our listeners, Cassandra's taken us on a great journey today, started to really unlock some of the mysteries of an LLC. But I think the key points that I heard, and Cassandra, please jump in if I don't recap this appropriately, is first and foremost, a short-term rental, it's a business. And we all want to create a legacy for our families. Number two, to do so, you've got to protect yourself and your personal assets. One of the best ways to do that is to form an LLC and to one way or another, get that short-term rental property into the LLC. You can reach out to Cassandra and the Jude Law Firm if you're in Florida um, we can vouch for this. She does an amazing job of managing this for you, the short-term rental owner. They will eliminate the complexity for you. They'll manage this on your behalf so that you can be confident and comfortable that you are protected and you are following all the guidelines associated with the LLC. They'll keep the cost manageable for you. And they'll manage the annual renewal process that's required once you have the LLC. And um, I've found in the past that attorneys can be difficult because they, they make things difficult by using legalese in their language. And you don't do that. You keep things really straightforward. You make it easy to work with. And um, again, I, I couldn't recommend you more highly to folks that are in Florida. On that note, though, if we have listeners outside the state of Florida, what's the best way for them to identify a legal firm like yours that is uh, very user friendly, but also just to give the client great confidence? I would say if you're already working with an attorney, which I would hope that if you're purchasing real estate, this is just an aside, you're using, I would hope, an attorney in the title process just to verify that the property is okay to proceed on. Referrals are the best way. Now, if you've never worked with an attorney before, you can certainly reach out to me and I, because I know many attorneys throughout the 50 states that, that I trust and work with. Um, but another resource as well is the state bar. So like if you're in Colorado, for example, which I know that is where you hail from TC, <laughs> the um, Colorado bar has a referral service and a website set up and they they do a pretty good job of vetting attorneys as well. If you just don't even know where to start. That's awesome. That's really uh, an awesome way for our listeners to think about identifying a great firm to work with. So, Tim, I think um, that covers it all. Hopefully, we've we've given our listeners both the confidence and competence to take on this endeavor, this part of a short-term rental business to protect their assets and to develop that legacy for their family. Yes. And, uh, you know, we will have all of the Jude Law Firm's contact information in the descriptions. And uh, everyone, thank you again. It's been another great episode. Like, subscribe, tell your friends, anyone looking or thinking about getting into short-term rentals, we are here to help. We're here to provide the blueprint and we will see you next time.